Rob, let's start with you in the United States. Um, the US role in the region has been seen by many as crucial. Asia is often thought, uh, the US is often thought as the kind of balancer in chief and famously Lee Kuan Yew once described the United States as Asia's least distrusted power. And yet these days, and not just because of Mr. Trump, it predates his election, there are questions about American power and purpose in the region. Um, what's your sense of the trajectory of, of US leadership in Asia over the next 10 years or so? Uh, well, if you look back to the past, since Nixon went to China in 1972, U.S. policy towards China and Asia in general has been more or less consistent, whether the presidents have been Democratic or Republican. It was seen that China was just too important for, for partisan politics to dramatically affect foreign policy. This has not been the case in the Middle East and other parts of the world, but it has been in Asia. However, with the Trump presidency, we've seen a break. Uh, we've seen a break from, uh, you know, from, from an idea of building a kind of um, liberal world order with democracy, human rights, or civil society, human rights, as a kind of, as a kind of bumper sticker, and, and, and to pay a lot of attention to American alliances in Asia, from Japan south to Australia. With the Trump presidency, we do not see isolationism. But what we see is a kind of zero-sum bilateralism, where the, the Trump administration approaches each country, China, you know, you know, you know, uh, uh, China's trade practices, how are we going to get them to change it? North Korea, how are we going to get them to get rid of their nuclear, uh, nuclear weapons and missiles? With each country, it's separate. And that, of course, undermines American alliance building. And I think that weakens the United States in Asia because China has the natural geographical advantage because it is the natural demographic, geographical, uh, pol um, uh, economic organizing principle of the region. All the United States has to compete with that is an idea, a great idea, which is encompassed by alliances. So there has been a break so on that. Do you sense that, the, that under Trump, US policy is kind of on autopilot? Do you see a, a, a big, is there a big plan? Is it opportunistic? What, you know, is there method in, in what Trump is doing? Look, uh, foreign policy of any country emanates from a nation's domestic conditions. And the domestic conditions in the United States have deteriorated largely in the heartland over recent decades, you know, among the middle class. And that's led to, that's led to a real change in, you know, in foreign policy. But history, of course, doesn't throw up a nuanced, you know, respectable leader. Uh, you know, history is very disruptive, and what Trump really is is he's a kind of unknowing, ignorant agent of historical change, and and that's kind of what we have here. And he has instincts, and he has you know a, a way to immediately see the vulnerability in any person he meets or in any nation that he encounters. So it's part instinct, but he also has policymakers around him. Uh, who are far less, you know, far less brutal in their judgments and are able to, at least trying able to articulate his basic instincts and transform them into policy. For a lot of, for, for a lot of analysts, um, America has been the key to East Asia's long peace. Now, I'm not saying that's necessarily right, but there is a sense that the US has been, whether it's because its presence has meant the Japanese military spending was kept in check, whether it meant that most of the region didn't have to do things like keep sea lanes of, of communication open, and it meant that the kinds of um, sort of security dilemmas that might appear weren't there. Um, do you think Asia's peace in the future depends on American security role, or is, or if, because if you get this continued kind of nativism and, and American yeah. retrenchment, do we have a fundamental weakness in the uh, security it, order? It do, Asia does not depend totally on America's security role, but over the last 70 years or so, it's depended heavily on it. Because uh, the, the, the Western Pacific, despite the Vietnam War, despite Korea, has been, in effect, a, a unipolar American naval lake for three quarters of a century. But with the rise of the Chinese Navy, 
uh, and air force, what you're, and ballistic, land-based ballistic missiles, what you're seeing is a far more multipolar, unstable military environment that affects the security. America is the only country in a, you know, that's active in Asia that does not have territorial ambitions inside Asia and is therefore a kind of uh, balancing, uh, stabilizing power. They, what they used to say for many years about Pacific Command in Hawaii is that Pacific Command functioned as NATO, in a sense, an informal kind of NATO. So I think if America's role, if America, you know, if, if America's role in these matters is diminished, with only the U.S. Navy there as a stabilizing force, without you know, without a, a, the White House backing it up, um, st you know, sec uh, stability in Asia has to be affected downward. I would think. Can can the domestic politics of American sort of national power accept a diminished role for the United States in Asia? Um, that's a very good question because. Uh, the rise of the Chinese Navy, for instance, to get right at your question, you know, it, it cannot be denied. The United States has to make room for a rising China in Asia militarily, economically. It, it, the question is how much room. And that takes a very nuanced policy, to say the least. Uh, to convert Asia from a unipolar to a multipolar security order. Uh, this has to be done, but, it's, uh, but the problem with that is translating that to political bumper stickers in a domestic environment, a highly inflamed domestic environment inside the United States will be very, very hard to do. Um, Fu, we want to turn now to China, the other big player in the region. Um, We've seen the, re the return of Chinese power is the big story in the region. It's probably the big story in world history of the past three or four decades. Uh, and China's revival under President Xi has also come with an ambitious, confident place that, that President Xi wants to take China to. And if you looked at his speech to the uh, 19th Party Congress last year, where he said that by the middle of the century, of this century, uh, China will become a global leader in terms of national strength and international influence. In the Belt and Road Initiative, you see probably the biggest infrastructure program in world history, which attempts, which is presented as an attempt to, to build connectivity for not just China, but for essentially the entire Eurasian landmass land mass and beyond. Uh, President Xi is also uh, presented China as a leader of multilateralism, a defender of globalization, a defender of free trade. Um, what is China's vision for international order? What, you know, the 64 billion renminbi, renminbi question that we ask is, what does China want? Um, what kind of international order does, does China want? Well, thank you, Nick. Uh, I think this is quite complex a question. You ask too many things. <laughs> Perhaps you, you trust me too much that I can answer all of those things or remember this. Uh, uh, since my Chinese is better than English, I would like to, uh, to uh, show my opinions in Chinese. For those of you who don't speak Chinese, please shape to uh, China too. That might uh, help you to uh, precisely understand what, what I, I'm talking about. Uh, 关于中国对世界秩序的愿景是什么这个理念是中国人对未来世界的一个理想一个呢就是世界的事要由世界各国来共同来商量来参与来承担责任 
来分享发展成果。那么，这是一个中国，呃，对世界秩序的一个非常重要的一个理念。那么，这就是说，是未来的世界新秩序应该反映和代表世界各国。的利益，人民的利益，不能仅仅代表少数国家，或者是仅仅大国的利益。这是第二点。第三点呢，也就是在世界事务上，要由大国小国要一律平等，不能大国强国把自己的意志强加到。小国弱国的理念上去，所以总的来说，就是人类社会应该大家有困难共同承担，有利益大家共同分享，这是一个理想主义的呃一个理念。但是呢，这种理想需要世界各国共同来推动。那么，所以在中国。在内部也发生了非常大的变化。这个理念的提出，是过去中国几十年，因为它在发展过程发展到今天之前，中国是很弱的。甚至在一八四八年之后，中国的鸦片战争之后，中国长期受西方的我们叫欺负啊，不管是侵略也好，中国人们的心里，他有切身的感受。不希望你强大了，你就欺负别人。所以这种三百多年的这种感受，导致他今天中国强大了，中国发展了。这个时候不能用西方二十世纪，从十八世纪到二十世纪所形成的知识、经验和做法来运行二十一、二十二世纪。这是。呃，中国人的一个基本想法，所以习近平主席提出了这个东西呢。由于在沟通上我们存在一些困难，所以呢，没有把这个理念和让外部世界充分理解，再加上时间比较短，所以“一带一路”就是一个非常好的例子。“一带一路”，第一，它不是中国的“一带一路”。是中国倡议的，至少在“一带一路”的六十四个国家共同的“一带一路”。第二个呢，“一带一路”是一个长远的，可能影响上百年的这么个“一带一路”。所以，在他刚开始的时候，谁都没有经验，谁都不知道怎么去做。那么，现在存在的一些问题呢，就很容易被理解。第三个呢？尽管我们不是非常清楚未来会能这个实现“一带一路”是怎么做，但一个理念非常重要，这就是中国提出来的，也是习近平主主席提出的“一带一路”的原则是什么？共商、共建、共享。这个共商不是中国要说我要这么做，你们来服从我，而是说你所在的国家你要做什么，看看我们能不能合作。这是商，共建呢是把世界的企业、政府联系在一起。那么在这一段呢，这五年提出来啊，这一部分做的还没有做的非常好，所以呢，大家呃感觉到说我们世界没参与。其实特别是企业界，因为我知道美国啊、呃、呃欧洲、日本很多企业，他非常想参与。但是呢，不知道信息没有渠道，这是我们下一步要解决的问题。那么问题呢，在中国看来有两面性，就是说风危机是一样的。我们特别重视有问题，问题才是解是未来发展的起点。把现存的问题解决了，就会有更好的未来。所以这个“一带一路”呢，习近平特别提出来说。不是中国的独唱，是世界的大合唱。但是做目前没有做到那一步，我觉得这是个时间问题。中国人有个好处
，愿意学习，愿意在错误中学习，愿意改变自己。你们看到中国现在说中国的崛起，中国的发展，其实如果你回头看，这个发展过程变化最大的是在中国内部。为什么中国内部会变成这样？就是中国不断解决自己存在的问题，不断的批评自己、改变自己，我们叫改革。这个“改革”这个词儿呢，可能大家都懂这个词儿，在中国的意义是不一样的。中国意义就是改变自己。那么我们看西方，更多的是喜欢，叫我们叫 “point finger”。我觉得世界是将来的世界是。自己主动改变自己，才能改变别人。你要想去改变别人，用过去二十世纪，不管是军事实力还是军事实力，你去压迫别人，去强迫别人改变，你不能有最终的成功。这就是中国人的想法。I'm I'm sure in the questions we'll come back to more about Belt and Road and the. The sort of learning aspect of, of Belt and Road. I, I want to turn now to India and Jay um, ask you about the country as we discussed in the, the earlier panel. It's often in the shadows. You talk about the US and China, and we forget that there's this third big power in the region that, that's growing, that's increasingly ambitious. Um, and India has um, become a more visible part of the geopolitical conversation. Uh, and in the adoption of President Trump's phrase, the sort of free and open Indo-Pacific, we see in the United States uh, an acceptance of and a use of a concept that's been uh, advocated and, and came out of India in the first instance, that is the notion of the region that India inhabits as, as the Indo-Pacific. What, what is India's understanding of this term and does it differentiate from, from the term that the United States or Australia or others use? Mm -hmm. uh, well. Uh, you know, the term's actually been around for about 10 to 15 years now. It's been used in India. Uh, in fact, about 10 years ago, Prime Minister Abe, in his first uh, incarnation, <clears throat> used a similar term. The fact that Donald Trump picked it up and it became news, if nothing else shows, America still counts. Uh, now, in terms of what does it mean, it means different things to different people. Okay, so it's a bit like a Rashomon effect. Uh, to the Indians, it's actually a way of saying that our horizons are widening. We have interest to the east, to the Pacific. Uh, bear in mind, more than 50% of our trade today is east of India. Uh, so, you know, the look east, act east policy, if you're going to take it further into the Pacific, engage China, Japan, Korea, Australia, uh, then you got to, then India has to have a Pacific policy as well. So I think for the Indians, it's a way of saying, okay, we've changed uh, longer reach, different interests, uh, different activities in a way. I think to other countries, it means different things. I think to the Japanese, for example, it would mean a kind of a Western reach that Japan, which is not an Indian Ocean power, now starts taking interest there. To the Americans, I think it's a way of saying that the challenges in the Pacific and Indian Ocean are more seamless and need to be dealt with more seamlessly. I think the Chinese who don't subscribe to it, at least nothing that I've seen, actually have been practicing it. I mean, the fact that you have a Chinese base in Djibouti, you have uh, facilities in Hambantota, in Gwadar, uh, the Chinese Navy is in the Indian Ocean, uh, shows that they too have it as a, as a practical working concept. So I think it's a description of a changing landscape or changing seascape in a way. Uh, it highlights also a greater maritime emphasis because maritime is more global commons in Asia. Uh, you know, the land uh, connectivity is much more nationally owned. Uh, including the BRI, uh, so so I would you know I would really sum it up as uh, changes, tighter integration between uh, South Asia, <coughs> East Asia, and the responses of and the uh, descriptions of different countries of this changing landscape. One one feature of the Quad, uh, sorry, one feature of the the Indo-Pacific has been the revival of the Quad. So this mm -hmm. is the Quadrilateral Security Initiative that brings together uh, Australia, Japan, the U.S. and India. Um, at so far it's in its sort of infancy. How does India see the Quad? What does they see the potential utility of bringing these four Indo-Pacific powers together? Well, 
You know, uh, look at what's common in a way. They all have market economies. Uh, they're all democracies. Uh, they're all maritime powers. Uh, so I think you have uh, the basis for considerable convergence here. Uh, so we see it as a diplomatic mechanism. Beijing sees it potentially as containment of its interests. Look, uh, I, I think because a set of like-minded people gather to discuss something shouldn't make others insecure if they're confident of what they're doing. Now, you know, I, I, can't, I can't find solutions for other people's insecurity. I can only uh, find solutions for my security. Uh, so, you, can't, you know, in a, in a way, we are dealing with a world where every country is widening its options. So it's a kind of all against all or all vis-a-vis -vis all in a way. So uh, the suggestion that somehow people with uh, countries with converging interests shouldn't meet to discuss it because other people are, have an issue, that's like uh, having a veto on other people's actions. It's, it's constraining other people's options. Uh, so in a, in a truly democratic world, that shouldn't be happening. And what does India see the benefit of operating in the sort of multilateral institutions, whether they're the ASEAN-centred groups like the East Asia Summit mm -hmm. uh, or other mechanisms? Are they an important part of the story or sort of a side, a side show for India? No, it's not a side show. I think if you see the big changes in India going back to 1992, a lot of those changes are centred uh, around ASEAN, around Singapore specifically, uh, around the East Asia Summit. Uh, in fact, in India, this is pretty much synonymous, the engagement with the ASEAN, synonymous with the period of change and growth in India. Uh, and the fact is, for all the limitations of these mechanisms, it's the only game in town. Uh, there is no, uh, no, Asia has not been able to produce an architecture other than what the ASEAN has produced. And it's grown beyond Asia. It today includes US, it includes Canada, it includes Russia. Uh, so uh, I, I think uh, sometimes people don't uh, fully put a value to what they have actually done here. And I think they've, they've really produced a kind of a lowest common denominator uh, to really get as much of the world together in Asia as possible. And finally, um, before we move to the Southeast Asia question, We've, we've heard a lot about how the US-China relationship is the most important bilateral relationship in the world. Where do you see the India-China bilateral relationship going? Because it's, it's arguably the second most important bilateral relationship in the world. Look, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't put a ranking on it. It's certainly <laughs> a very important uh, relationship. Uh, I mean, bear in mind, we are each other's largest neighbors. Uh, we have a very substantial economic relationship. We also have a very complex history and a very uh, sort of uh, uh, nuanced political relationship. Uh, in many ways, uh, I think uh, the, there are uh, issues between the two countries. I, I don't think one can deny that. Uh, but they've also grappled in the last 30 years to, uh, f to at least stabilize it and, and find some common ground. Uh, so it is, it is uh, by all means, I would say it's a difficult relationship. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I think uh, the uh, purpose uh, of, of uh, both countries, certainly I can speak for India, uh, is to find ways of uh, strengthening the elements of stability in the relationship and uh, making sure that the differences that we have don't become disputes and the contradictions that we have don't become conflicts. Bill Harry, yeah. I want to turn now to, to Southeast Asia. Um, Southeast Asia has been a place for, for not just decades, but for centuries where major powers have bumped up against one another. And the culture of Southeast Asia is very much a, a, a visible manifestation of the, this intersection role that this part of the world has played. Uh, but there's a risk that in the contemporary geopolitical environment that Southeast Asia once again becomes the thoroughfare of great power interests. And, and I think ASEAN was extraordinarily successful at walling off this part of the world from, from great power rivalry during the Cold War. Do you think ASEAN's gonna be able to continue to play a significant security role in sustaining Southeast Asia, influencing the region, and keeping great power rivalry at bay? Okay, let me begin by clarifying one thing. It is not that great power rivalry came back. It never left, <laughs> all right? 
uh, in particular, it never left Southeast Asia. It's the crossroads between two major oceans. This is where powers, great or small, meet. <laughs> uh, ASEAN and, and, and Southeast Asia is an extremely diverse region. ASEAN, in its most fundamental purpose, is a mechanism for coping with that diversity, for managing that diversity. And in a sense, everything else we do is means to this fundamental end. Uh, uh, and in this fundamental end, no matter what our other shortcomings, and there are many, uh, we have been very successful. There has been no war among us and countries. Tensions, skirmishes, yes, but no war. Not something to be taken for granted if you looked at the state of Southeast Asia before ASEAN. Secondly, I think if you look at the context of Southeast Asia, uh, if you look at that vast region from the United States, to uh, the, west, uh, the west of India, uh, in the south to Australia and New Zealand. This is a naturally multipolar region. <laughs> and the multipolarity is being reinforced because India is emerging as Japan normalizes after Mr. Abe and its, his successors becomes a more normal country. Uh, it doesn't mean they'll break with the U.S. alliance. It'll mean they want a more independent role with the U.S. alliance. Ditto for South Korea, ditto for Australia. Now, this multipolarity gives ASEAN the possibility of maneuver, provided we have the wit and the agility to take advantage of it. Maneuver in order to maintain autonomy. And in our external engagements, no matter what differences we have in strategic outlook within ASEAN, the one value we have in common is the preservation of autonomy. And I think we have been fairly successful at it. Uh, that is the most profound meaning of this term that has been so often used but very little understood, ASEAN centrality. ASEAN centrality means ASEAN has been made in able to make itself useful to all the major powers. As Jaya Shankar said, despite its limitations, forums like the ARF, the East Asia Summit, this is the only game in town. Uh, uh, the, the limitations are because it is the only limit, game in town. Again, it is a means of coping with diversity. Sometimes it means that ASEAN is a very flexible, shape-shifting organization. Sometimes on this issue, we tilt this way. Sometimes on another issue, we tilt another way. Sometimes we move faster than other times, but it is always to maintain order among our members and autonomy, as much autonomy as possible, vis-a-vis -vis major powers. Uh, so I don't think we can, uh, I don't think this is going to go away. I, this is the natural instinct of a region that has lived in the midst of major power competition even before there were modern states. Uh, one final point. Hedging, balancing, and bandwagoning are not, in Southeast Asia's diplomatic tradition, alternatives as they are in Western political science theory, which is largely rubbish. Uh, it is something we all naturally do simultaneously. <laughs> Again, sometimes you may emphasize balancing, sometimes you may balance uh, emphasize hedging a little bit more, sometimes bandwagoning, but you do all three things simultaneously. One of the other, one of the other ways in which ASEAN centrality is often also uh, meant is the way in which it conveys the centrality of ASEAN in the foreign policies of its members. And I think one of the concerns that some have had is, is that the solidarity of ASEAN is not quite what it used to be, that there are divisions, whether they're between rich and poor or between divisions about external loyalties. Do you see ASEAN being able to sustain that centrality in the minds of its membership over time? Well, Mr. S. Rajaratnam, uh, in his speech in 1967 on the signing of the Bangkok Declaration, made a point. He said that henceforth, some idea of the regional, regional interest must be part of all our ideas of the national interest. And I think all the other four foreign ministers that were there in Bangkok at that time made essentially the same point in, in their own way. Now, over time as ASEAN has expanded, uh, and because of the long peace we have 
enjoy in the region, some of the newer members, that sense, is somewhat weaker. But I don't think it's entirely gone away. If, I, if I, I'm retired now, I can say it. There's only one country in which the sense is very weak. That's Cambodia. And that's Cambodia under Mr. Hun Sen. But Mr. Hun Sen is not going to live forever. We miss you at these, these events, Bill Harry, because we're never quite sure what you think. Um, we've now got time for questions. We've got about 10 or 15 minutes left for questions. So get them through the iPad. We've got a, through, the, through the app device. We've got a number coming through. One point that, that's a really interesting one, which I was hoping we'd grapple with, is the question of sort of cyber security, non-conventional conflict, and the way in which geopolitics in the 21st century may be different from sort of conventional geopolitics. So, so I was wondering if members of the panel might think about or give some thoughts as to how we factor in whether it's radicalism, separatism, cyber security, unconventional conflict. Um, that break the mold with the sort of geopolitics of, of the 20th century and how that may influence how the region may, may evolve. Rob. Uh, yeah, just very quickly, I think uh, cyber will become an element of geopolitics and further complexify it. For instance, we could have massive cyber attacks on a scale of which we have not seen so far that could elicit a conventional military response in some ways, like taking down of a country's electric grid or stock market for a few days or, some, or something like that. If you really look at the competition that's going on between the United States, Iran, China, and other countries, it's, you know, it's in addition to an economic and political competition, it's cyber competition as well both aggressive and defensive measures. Uh, we know that China and the United States are competing for who will develop the best 5G uh, you know, uh, uh, um, operating environment for, uh, you know, for, for, for uh, electronic communication. So that, you know, and the futures of all of, you know, of naval activity, Air Force activity, et cetera, are increasingly in the cyber realm. So it's kind of like, uh, when the Portuguese discovered the, you know, oceanic, uh, you know, when the when the oceans became a vehicle for national competition, and you know, in in during the early days of the age of exploration. Jay, uh, look, I I think we have to accept today that I mean the world is very interdependent. We know that very constrained. So even the rise of powers is different than it used to be. I mean, if you look at it, China is the first big power which has risen, first global power to have risen without a war. Uh, so you are winning without really fighting or not fighting the old-fashioned way. So when, but since the competition and games between nations continue, they resort to other means. Now, some of it is terrorism, so it's below a certain threshold. Some of it is, uh, could be cyber. Uh, it could be economic. It could be dependence, including through connectivity. So the nature of competition, the, nature, the, the instruments, the mechanisms of how influence is going to be uh, arbitrated, all of that is actually uh, going to change. And, you know, and what we are seeing out of the US, because that's where the, uh, the conversation began, we are really seeing at the heart of it two uh, autonomous phenomena. Okay? One is uh, an America which doesn't like global supply chains and global mobility. Uh, the second is an America responding to China. Now, they overlap, but they're not the same problem. So uh, when it comes to uh, challenges like cybersecurity, or I would even say uh, the weaponization of finance, the use of the dollar as a reserve currency to put pressure on other countries on, say, issues like Iran, uh, these are new forms of uh, politics and some would argue new forms of warfare. Bill Hurry. Well, I'm somebody who can barely use his I Apple iPhone, so you know, maybe I'm not the best person to answer this. But I think it really is, as Mr. Kaplan and Jai, Jai Shankar has said, it enhances, to my mind, what has always been a reality Southeast Asian countries have to face. That is external influences. And it, it enhances in a very direct way. It can come right into the middle of your the heart of your society, not only on the periphery working its way in. Uh, it takes many forms. It, uh, it can take form of cyber attacks, which is a new form of warfare. Singapore suffered one not so long ago. 
It can take the form of the influence of ideas, for example, Middle Eastern varieties of Islam, uh, changing the texture, Arabizing Islamic societies in, in Southeast Asia. It, it is something that we will all have to learn to cope with. It can be an instrument or influence of major powers on the smaller countries of Southeast Asia. But it's not. It's new in its technology, in its methods, in its directness, in its difficulty to deal with, but it is an enhancer of something we have always faced. So it's not, not a kind of game changer. It's a well, it, it, it can change the game because it's, uh, it's a new game. Uh, I think we're all learning, big or small, how to cope with it. <laughs> Nobody has the answer yet. Okay, I've got a question about Belt and Road, for, firstly for Fu, and interested in the rest of the panel's views. And, and the, the question is, essentially, would you agree that Belt and Road needs to become a global project? That's to say, does it need to become a multilateral project about global governance so as to reduce the risk that, it'll, that it is seen as a means purely for China to project influence? Uh, 那么这个往往不会构成真正的安全问题一个很大的风险能不能成为世界的一带一路所以这个呢所以我认为一带一路一定会成功。为什么？它只要对各个国家有好处，它就能成功。如果对多数国家都没好处，一定不会成功。Other panelists want to want to pitch in on uh, Belt and Road, or we can go to another. Well, if I can yeah, just please. offer a brief comment. Uh, look. Uh, I, I, I mean, uh, let's, I'm not judging the overall Belt and Road, but certainly I can say from the Indian perspective, there was no consultation between China and India on the Belt and Road. I mean, if anybody else was consulted, I wouldn't know. Uh, I'm, I'm not particularly aware of that. Uh, but I, I think it was a, I mean, my sense of it was it was a pretty unilateral initiative. Um. Yeah, uh, yes, I think I see Belt and Road in several ways. First of all, it's a branding mechanism for what China has already accomplished in former Soviet Central Asia, building roads, railways, energy pipelines. And those roads, railways, and energy pipelines across Central Asia are linking up China with Iran. 
and Iran is the real major organizing principle of the Middle East in terms of economics, culture, uh, education, and at China, and at China is doing a lot of investment, I infrastructure investment, etc., in Iran, and a Chinese-Iranian alliance or you know, functional alliance will uh, have many effects. One is to sideline Russia, which we haven't spoken about as much. Um, and I think um, when I look at what, what China is doing, building or helping to finance the building of ports in Sri Lanka, Myanmar, uh, Bagamayo in Tanzania, Djibouti, uh, Gwadar in Pakistan, what I'm seeing really is the early days of the British East India Company or the early days of the Dutch East India Company, where China is feeling its way to a kind of maritime commercial throughput empire that may very well have military application in the years and decades to come. Well, it's a very broad, ambitious label or vision. Uh, right now, it is a collection of projects. Some work better than others. Some have different motivations. I have not yet I have not been convinced yet it adds up to something strategically coherent. I've got a very interesting question about the environment, uh, and in particular, uh, the question's asking how each of you foresee how the Asia-Pacific countries might mitigate dwindling environmental resource uh, risks, and in particular, what are the prospects of environmentally driven conflicts, whether they're about water scarcity, other resource scarcity, climate change, and the like? How much should this be a factor in our geopolitical thinking? I, I think it's a significant factor. For instance, Bangladesh, which has a larger population than Russia, lives at sea level. Um, and just the slightest rise in, in you know, in, in, in just the slightest sea level rise will lead to alkalinity in the soil, um, or, you know, um, a drought, all kinds of, you know, counterintuitively drought, uh, et cetera. So that's a country with one of the world's largest populations that will be dramatically affected. Most people in the Indonesian archipelago, et cetera, most of the world's population lives within 200 miles of a coastline. So rising sea levels are gonna have a, could have a dramatic effect on human security. I think it's going to be a very significant factor, but I am afraid that most of the ASEAN countries do not think sufficiently about it. I would say that environmental challenges may actually bring countries together, uh, particularly responding to natural disasters. I think the ish bigger, more divisive issue would be issues like sharing uh, river water uh, flows, particularly across boundaries. Uh, and uh, because as the use of water becomes more and more valuable uh, and the predictability of water flows becomes more and more uncertain, uh, to my mind, that would be a big issue of concern. Well, I think we are just about out of time. So if you could return back to the polling, I'm afraid there are many questions, great questions here, but we can't uh, unfortunately address, although all the panelists are here for the rest of the day, so in the coffee and lunchtime, make sure you bail them up and, and pitch your questions at them. Uh, but we want to return back to that uh, polling question from the start as to whether you remain optimistic, pessimistic, or somewhere in the middle uh, in terms of where Asia's geopolitics are heading over the next 10 years. Um, whilst we're just waiting for that, I'll, I'll pitch one final question to, to uh, Bill Hari. And that is, you, you mentioned Cambodia being a problem in, in ASEAN. Uh, question asker wants to know whether you think uh, Burma, Myanmar, is at a risk of becoming a second Cambodia. No, I was talking about it in one very specific context. The idea that the, re the regional interest has to be part of the natural in national interest is weakest, not completely non-existent, -exist weakest in Cambodia. That is the specific context. I think Myanmar has that sense of the regional interest being part of the national interest. They have some other problems in Rakhine State and so on. Uh, there is a very fundamental problem is what is the whole direction of political evolution in Myanmar, but that's a different set of issues. All right, so it looks like we've made you less optimistic. 
Good. So we started at 49. Good. Bill Hari thinks that's a good sign. Um, started at 49%, highly optimistic. Now we're only down to 38%, with 52% moderately, but only 7% not at all optimistic. So I guess that's a result with, with which we can feel comfortable. Um, please join me in thanking our four panellists uh, and look forward to your morning tea.